Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending our webinar. We have uh, got about two more minutes before we start. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending our webinar. Um, we have a couple more minutes. Um, I'm going to hang out there until so everyone can get signed on, and we will start right at 12 o'clock. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon and welcome to today's presentation using care coordination for your highest risk patients. My name is Joy Harrell and I will be your facilitator today. At this time, all attendee lines are muted to minimize background noise and distractions. We encourage your questions and input throughout this presentation, so please feel free to use the raise hand icon in your taskbar or submit questions and comments in the chat box providing. Today's presentation is re being recorded and later uploaded to our Health Visions Delmarva PTN YouTube channel. We ask everyone to visit the channel by going to YouTube and searching Health Visions Delmarva PTN. You can also subscribe to this channel and even get post notifications as we upload more content. Now I would like to introduce our first speaker for today. Our first speaker will be Dr. Marika Gray. Dr. Gray, MD, FACP, is a practicing internist and a regional medical director for WellSent Health, a multi-specialty system based in South Central Pennsylvania. In her current position, she provides executive leadership for the WellSent Medical Group to assure effective and efficient delivery of quality medical care, consistent with the mission, mission and vision of the WellSent Health System. Dr. Dr. Gray's road as a champion of quality improvement efforts in healthcare began as one of the primary physicians involved in the development rollout, and maintenance of Wellspin's first outpatient electronic health record, EHR. This experience taught her the power of the EHR to capture important data and facilitate quality care, but also that the EHR adoption alone cannot transform health care. She believes in team-based care delivery model involving an integrated approach with both primary and specialty care and built on a firm foundation of data that is customized to the patient and the team delivering the care. In her role as Regional Medical Director, she has led WellSpan's outpatient efforts in patient-centered medical home, specialty care, and connected care recognition, as well as collaborative, collaborative efforts to further quality improvement throughout all her outpatient practices. Her patient is a quadruple aim, creating a safe, efficient, happy, and healthy population and workplace. Our second speaker will be Dr. Edward R. Sobel. Dr. Sobel, DO, is a board-certified family practice physician retired senior partner and family physician at Family Practice Associates and a current senior attending staff member and executive committee member of the Department of Family and Community Medicine at Christiana Health System in Wilmington, Delaware. He is currently the medical director of Health Visions Delmarva PTN, the Healthcare Quality Improvement Program for Quality Insights of Delaware, 
and the Delaware Regional Extension Center. Dr. Sobel's awards include the Delaware Academy of Family Physicians, Family Physician of the Year, the Christiana Care Health System, Preceptor of the Year, and the Medical Society of Delaware Daniel A. Alvarez, MD Service Award for helping to implement over 1,000 physicians on electronic medical records. Our third speaker will be Tashima Heiliger. Tashima Heiliger, RN, is a clinical professional with over 20 plus years of experience. She's a master's prepared nurse and a graduate of both Wilmington University and Wesley College in Delaware. Tashima has been a registered nurse for over 20 years. She has, had several, has held several diverse positions in the nursing field to include critical care nurse, inpatient case manager, outpatient oncology care coordinator, and clinical manager of Bay Health Medical Center's care management department. She is currently the program manager of Population Health at Bay Health Medical Center. In her current role, she works for the Bay Health Physician Alliance, clinically integrated network on quality initiatives, projects, and other programs such as the FSSP ACO. Tashima collaborates and works closely with several internal and external entities and healthcare professionals to advance the Bay Health Initiative for care coordination in the Bay Health community and surrounding areas. Our fourth and last speaker will be Amanda Hottenstein. Amanda Hottenstein, MHA, is a practice advisor for Health Vision Samarva, a practice transformation network working through CMS Transforming Clinical Practice Initiative. Amanda completed her Master's of Healthcare Administration at Georgia Southern University. While completing her degree, she worked with local hospitals and practices on quality and performance improvement. Prior to completing her Master's degree, Amanda attended Marshall University, where she received a received bachelor's degrees in both athletic training and psychology. She worked closely with, with the emergency department and orthopedic surgeons at the medical center, specifically with a sports medicine team to provide premier care for athletes in the community. Amanda also facilitated quality improvement efforts in both departments. At this time, I would like to welcome Dr. Gray to begin, to begin today's presentation. Wonderful. Thank you for the comprehensive introduction. I have to let everybody know that I also have a personal connection with um, the Delmarva area. I live in Maryland at this point in time, and I went to University of Delaware for my undergrad, and since you're in a care, I remember being a candy striper there. So um, it's really good to be able to talk to you today. So today I'm going to start our talk off by a little bit about population health and really setting the foundation for this webinar. And population health is all about seeing the trees and the forest. Next slide. So I'm going to start with the polling question and uh, for our teams. And I'm afraid I do not have the question in front of me, so I'm hoping it's on the next slide. If not, I'm going to have somebody pop in on the webinar. Okay, the question is, my team is currently doing population management. Our practice is already doing population, okay, my team is currently doing population management, or our practice is already doing population evaluation, or is this practice currently coordinating care with patients? And the answers are yes on every patient every time, or yes on subpopulation of patients, or no, we haven't stayed, started yet and are looking for. Joy, you have to begin the polling question so people can answer. It's, it's not up currently that they can answer it. Thank you so much. Every mm -hmm. webinar system is slightly different. So if we go to the next slide, it should be there, hopefully. Yeah, Joy, ha Joy has to open it on the go to webinar. There we go. Uh, uh, sorry. We go. My apologies. So, is your team currently doing population management? If, and if so, is it on every patient every time? Is it on a subpopulation of patients? Or you haven't started yet? Please take a second to vote. And we'll go five, four, three, two, one, and check the answers. Okay, I've got 14% are yes on every, they're still answering, yes on every patient every time, 53% yes on subpopulation of patients, and 33% no, we haven't started yet and are looking. Excellent. 
excellent. So we have a nice mix here. And we're going to go on to the second polling question. I, I think we combined the polling questions into one. So that, and that was perfectly fine. Yeah. yeah. All right. So we'll advance. So in order to, I find that whenever I listen to a talk like this, I first need to know where that person is coming from. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Wealthman Health. We have a mission of working as one to improve health through exceptional care for all, lifelong wellness, and healthy communities. Um, uh, our counties are in South Central Pennsylvania and Northern um, Maryland. We serve six counties and we have a varied patient population. So the characteristics range from rural to suburban to inner city. We have a large Amish population, but we also have a large inner city population as well. Next slide. So we are a community-based not-for-profit. We have six hospitals. Um, several dozen um, NCQA Level 3 certified patients at a medical home, so we're actually going up for recertification and we'll be able to do all of our um, practices at Level 3 once again. And we have 140 clinical flights ranging from pediatrics to geriatrics with subspecialties from OBGYN to oncology. So we have a little bit of everything in our mix. Next slide. And we're pretty big. So about, actually, now that it's July, it's about 1,100 employed physicians and advanced practice clinicians. Um, our largest group is primary care with about 250 physicians in that group, but then we have specialists all around. And it's 15,000 employees, so pretty big, and 49 primary care practices. Next slide. So what you should know about me, besides the fact that I'm a blue hen, is I'm also an internist, I'm an administrator. I spend 90% of my time actually in the executive role. And I'm primary care, and I'm primary care by choice. I knew from the second I hit residency that I wanted to be a primary care provider. I wanted to be outpatient. I wanted to see patients and take care of them throughout their lives. And as a primary care provider, next slide, we know that it's all about the trees. And when I say that, you hear people talking about, you know, looking at the trees and the forest. Well, in primary care, it's all about the trees. When you see your schedule, and you know, you know, you have your 9 a.m. sinusitis, so your 9:15 diabetic with retinopathy, your 9:30 depression, your 9:45 ADHD, um, stable on meds, and that's how a primary care office's day goes. It usually is kind of this is a problem, this is a problem, this is a problem, and we tackle the problem as we go along. And in gardening or forestry sense, it's like we're looking at individual trees. We find out what's wrong with that tree and we fix it. But one of the things that we need to do, next slide, is also start getting better about population health. And population health is more about the forest. And as um, folks working in primary care settings or even specialty settings, it's hard to know how that forest looks. But one of the things that we all have to get good at in the next decade of healthcare is really rising up above those day-to-day -day, um, worries and the day-to-day -day workflows and really being able to look at our entire population of patients at a time and really figuring out how our forest is doing. Next slide. So one of the things we did at Wellplan Health was we actually started with our care coordination teams. And we have the benefits as, as a system of actually having um, the major hospitals in our area being owned by us. So what we did was we said, you know what, in order to help with that population, we needed a dedicated team. And most of you working on this already know that having a social worker and a case manager is an essential part of this. What we did as well is we actually trained up our LPNs to become what we call health coaches in our primary care practices. And those health coaches were trained on motivational interviewing, how to um, do basic interventions. We um, uh, targeted them for extra education on diabetes and asthma and our more chronic diseases. And what we did was we paired them up with a social worker and a case manager who were hospital-based. So whereas before, if a patient went to the hospital, they got the case manager and social worker who happened to be on the floor, now they get the case manager and social worker who's assigned to their outpatient practice. 
So therefore, whether they're in a trauma floor, whether they're on a medical floor, whether they're on a surgical floor, whether they're on an OB floor, they get the same case manager and social worker. And we set it up that way to really leverage that continuity of care. Next slide. We also did targeted intervention. So every medical hospitalized patient is contacted by our health coaches on discharge to look at their medications and to ensure proper follow-up. Those care coordination teams, the, um, the case manager, social worker, and health coach also huddle daily to talk about patients and their needs. And only a small percent of patients who we engage like this actually needed ongoing management um, for more than six months. So when you hear about a program like this, it seems to be very intensive. And when you start to think, oh my goodness, are we going to do this with all of our patients? What we found out was actually, no, we didn't need to. We just needed to do this for a small amount. Next slide. So looking at our data, and my data um, is back from 2014 because um, being a system that's ever growing and improving, we're actually transitioning our electronic health records at this point in time and going um, onto a new one. Half of our system went in May, the other half in October, and of course that has played havoc with our data. But looking at how we work with care coordination, what you see here is that we have patients who, before they were engaged with the care coordination team, really used a lot of ER visits. And after um, engaging with our care coordination team, we managed to bring down that percentage of ER visits by about 51%. Next slide. We also were able to do a 76% decrease in unnecessary observations. Next slide. And not only that, but that also corresponded to a 74% decrease in hospitalization. As we become more at risk as officers and teams for the health of the patient and managing the healthcare dollar, being able to do this from a primary care um, perspective is huge, or even if you have a certain set of patients within your specialty practice. So really, one of the things to be able to do this is to be able to do risk stratification. How we risk stratified was we started with those patients who are hospitalized for medical reasons. That was an easy population to pick out. Um, but one of the things you want to think about as your team is who are the patients who are most at risk? How do you take care of them? And then how do you meet their needs? So another area that we looked at were our high utilizer patients. Next slide. So these are our um, patients who are our, for lack of a better word, frequent flyers. These are the patients who tend to be in the ER every single week, who are basically taking up a lot of your time and attention in the practice. And what we created was basically an ambulatory ICU. And we had a dedicated multi-specialty team dedicated to work with these patients. And it was set up and meant to be and continues to be only on a temporary basis. So they see these patients, they stabilize them, and they transition them back to their primary care office. So just as your patient doesn't stay in the ICU indefinitely, they don't stay in our Bridges to Health program indefinitely. Next slide. And the reason why we did this is that we are actually self-insured. So we looked at our own claims data and found that 4% of our members accounted for 49% of our healthcare spend. And because this is money that we're spending on ourselves, we said, what can we do to really manage that cost better for both our employees and their dependents? Next slide. So with this intervention, what we found is that we basically got 111 patients involved, 80% graduated. So that means that they were able to complete the program and they did not have to have any ongoing care. And what we saw for these patients was a 19% sustained reduction in ED utilization, a 25% sustained reduction in inpatient stays, and a 45% sustained reduction in observation stays. So this is our high-risk population. And what we defined our high-risk population at that point was patients who are over-utilizing the emergency department and healthcare resources. And we formed a team around them to take care of them and really make sure that they had all the support they need without having to go to the ER, without having to go to the hospital. And that was our way of meeting their needs. And as you can see from the numbers, it pulled down um, the changes dramatically. Next slide. 
So the other part that I want everyone to take away from this, because at some point in time, when you hear about population health, you start to think to yourself, yes, I'm helping the population, but what happens to my individual patient? What happens to that person who um, I see every day, and how does helping the population help them? And one of the things I want to reassure you is that when you make strides in the population, you are, of course, making strides for every individual patient. So one of the things we looked at were our pneumococcal vaccination rates in older adults, because for those of you who may not be clinical on the call, we have two new pneumococcal vaccines that have developed over the last um, five years or so. And what we know is that being able to give someone these vaccinations prevents um, unnecessary hospitalizations, it prevents cases of pneumonia, but not only that, but these are the strains of pneumonia that land people in the ICU can be so bad that folks get septic and have to lose um, life or limb. So really having a vaccine to be able to prevent that was a huge deal. And what we said was that, you know what, from a population health standpoint, because when you look at the numbers, the number needed to treat is about 140 patients to prevent one serious hospitalization or injury from pneumococcus. However, if that, and you start to think 140 patients, that's a lot to just help one life. But if that one life is your mother, your brother, your sister, or yourself, you know that immediately the math is worth it. So what we did was we established a program where we actually put in standing orders that as long as the patients met this criteria, the staff could actually administer it. And what we found was once we put this simple process in the hands of the staff, our vaccination rates increased. And not only did they increase, but they have been sustained for the last four years. And one of the mo biggest challenges in doing this quality improvement work is not only getting the work done, but being able to sustain it. And what you can see from here is that if you put in a process and you make it work and you monitor it, you can keep it going for years on end. Thank you very much. I am going to pass you on to Dr. Sobel, who's going to talk a little bit more about risk stratification. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we want to talk a little bit now about the smaller practice. We're going to kind of focus on your practice. So you may be a small primary care practice or a small specialty practice, and that's where we're going to uh, uh, be aiming. Let's start with our polling question. Okay, so the question is, our practice is already doing population evaluations. Uh, choose one of them. Yes, we are. No, we're not. Uh, we have no idea if our EHR can perform this function for us, uh, or we have started to look at this, but really not gone very far. Make your selection, and we'll see what comes up. Okay, um, answers are still coming in. Uh, we have 33% yes, 13% no, 27% have no idea if our EHR can perform this, and 27% have started to look at this but not, but have not gone any further. Okay, great. Okay, so we can go to the next slide. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about risk stratification. You know, how do we decide how sick our patients are? Uh, so risk stratification care management uh, is a process of assigning a, a health risk status to our patients uh, and then using that assessment to direct and improve care. The object of the game, if you will, uh, is to have the patients achieve the best health and quality of life possible uh, by preventing chronic disease, stabilizing their current conditions, and preventing acceleration in the higher risk categories. And, and why do we want to do that? Next slide. 
Okay. Well, you know, one of the reasons when I start to talk to physicians about this, they say, well, I, I take care of all of my patients. I take good care of all of my patients. And so, so why do I even need a risk stratified? It's kind of stupid. Uh, and, and the answer is, uh, it, it really is a direction of your resources. Uh, and, and secondarily, uh, every, every physician I talk to says I ought to be paid the most for taking care of my patients. I ought to get the highest level of compensation because all my patients are really sick. Well, you know, this is going to start to prove itself out. Are your patients really as sick as you think they are? Uh, you know, and how, how can we set them up so that we're really devoting the attention, uh, as my partner used to say, you know, to give the patients the things my mom has sent me to medical school uh, to take care of. Next slide. So we, we want to begin to identify who are our high-risk patients. Uh, and if we know that, we can then plan and work with uh, putting together a personalized care plan uh, along with the patient. And the patient needs to be involved with this. Uh, some patients will need more than others. Other patients uh, may need very little. Uh, you think about your you know, 25, 30-year-olds who you only see once in a while, uh, who generally are pretty healthy. You know, how much of your time and effort do you need to devote? to those patients. Next slide. So the question the physicians always ask for me is, well, how many patients are at high risk? I mean, if it's 80 or 90 percent of my practice, it's really not going to change. I'm not going to have the resources to do that. Well, if you look at a typical practice in primary care, for instance, uh, about 20 percent of your patients really need extra support. Those 20 percent of the patients account for for 80% of the total health care spending in the United States. And you saw that with Dr. Gray's slide. A very tiny percentage of their patients, they're being self-insured, were consuming uh, a, a disproportionate amount of the health care dollars. Uh, a very small percentage of your patients, tiny percent, uh, really uh, suck down the resources, as they say. Next slide. Now, if we're going to risk stratify them, uh, we really need to have a plan going forward. And, and this is a plan for developing a risk stratified care management uh, and coordination program. This is uh, through the AFP. If you're a member of the AFP, uh, you can get this for free. Otherwise, there's a fee associated with it. Uh, and while you think that this really looks complicated, I will tell you that this is about one third of the sheet that uh, comes out. I just couldn't get it on one slide without making the print totally eligible. Uh, so there's a lot involved in here, and you're looking at this going, this is way more than I can do, nor though I want to do this. Uh, so my answer to you is, let's see if we can start from a simpler basis and go forward. Next slide. So how does your practice this risk stratify. How, how can I do this in my office? So there's a couple different ways of doing this. Uh, often software will come with your EHR which will allow you to automatically risk stratify. And so for instance I want to show you in a second uh, the AFP levels of stratification. AFP has devised six levels of stratification. Uh, the uh, computer software you're going to see also has an alternate site management so in which case the practice determines who are going to be their high, medium, or low risk. And you, you can adjust this accordingly. How does the software know this? Uh, the software looks at the diagnoses that are in the patient's active problem list and then runs an algorithm which determines just how uh, significant is their risk uh, to the practice. Next slide. So here's a screenshot out a piece of a patient's uh, chart, uh, two arrows. Uh, you can see the, the upper arrow pointing, it says risk AFP, and in this uh, sample patient, the risk level is a five. The system is automatically determined uh, that in this case, the risk level for this patient is a five. At the same time, you can see that the site risk, where it, the practice has defined the the parameters that they're going to use, the risk level is low. So there's a lot of flexibility in doing this. The other arrow, the up pointing arrow, points to a little icon on the patient's uh, chart. And, and if we click on that icon, next slide, uh, you begin to see the little pop-up box that comes in there, begins to explain, uh, and you can go into detail about the patient's risk stratification. 
does your EHR do this? If you don't know that it's obviously there, it would be good to talk to the vendor and find out just what's available within your system. If it's there, great. Well, why don't you just go ahead and use it? If there's not something that is provided by the vendor, then you can customize your own risk management uh, stratification system. Next slide. So who are populations within your practice that might be at high risk? Uh, obviously your Medicare patients, older, may be at high risk. Not all of them. Some of them, uh, hopefully like me, are in good and vigorous health. But your diabetics, your asthmatics, uh, who are often in and out of the emergency room and other high-risk conditions. What the practice really needs to do is, as they say, decide where the money is and go after those patients uh, where you're going to concentrate your efforts. And again, looking at the capabilities of your EHR will identify the appropriate patients. Next slide. Okay, once you identify these patients, we're going to develop a workflow to uh, uh, decide on how we're going to handle these patients. Next slide. Okay, and here is an electronic health record. This is a uh, reporting module uh, in this electronic health record. And if you look in the large box at the uh, right side, you can see that we could click and decide which risk program and which levels that we want to decide uh, for this patient. So this system allows us to identify maybe we only want to do in the beginning our highest risk patients, those, uh, for instance, on the AAFP side that are uh, level six, or if you're doing a site uh, situation, you, you could go to give the level three, the high risk uh, that's on there. Next slide. Uh, and, and this just takes it a step further. Uh, so in this case, the practice is selecting. They're going to just look at patients who are at the highest level on the AFP scale, the level six. Next slide. Or if you don't even have that capability of having the system automatically define it, let's suppose uh, that you want to look at your Medicare patients uh, uh, who who are, I'm sorry, all your patients who are over age 18 who are diabetic uh, and have an elevated hemoglobin A1C uh, over 8. You can arbitrarily pick that number. Uh, clinicians know where they want to set to go after that, or patients who have an LDL. And so in this case, the practice has set up a program to identify all the patients within the practice that have a either a uh, hemoglobin A1C over 8 or an LDL uh, over 100. And th these numbers are, in this case, arbitrarily picked. Next slide. Th this is a typical reporting menu. Uh, and uh, this, this is what it would look like if, if you have the capability of doing internal reporting uh, directly within the practice. Next slide. Another choice uh, would be merely to do patients who have a hemoglobin A1C uh, over 9. So you can make it as uncomplicated as you want to make it. The previous one was required the patients to have either LD elevated or hemoglobin A1C. But again, lots of choices uh, for the practice to self-identify patients who they're interested in. Next slide. And what you get out of the process is a report identifying patients uh, who have a hemoglobin A1C over uh, 9. And uh, if, if you look at this now, you can't see the patient's names for HIPAA purposes. I need to cover the patients. Uh, they're in that first very narrow column. But if I were to expand that, you would see the patient's names. And so we can identify within this practice uh, the number of patients uh, who have a hemoglobin A1C over the value that we've selected. Next slide. And you could deal with this in a number of ways. You could use that list and call the patients. Uh, we used to call that uh, dialing for dollars in our practice, uh, getting patients into the office to be seen, to talk to them. Uh, these are the diabetics that you want to be after. Pa he hemoglobin A1C obviously uh, has implications for long-term complications and a, a downward spiral. Or in this case, the practice is using its patient portal, uh, and we've just kind of, you know, clicked in some stuff, but you could be sending an email to all of your patients who have a hemoglobin A1C over 9 with some message from the practice that uh, we need to do better and to make a, an appointment to come in. Next slide. 
So working on a care coordination and outreach project, uh, you need to look at your practice and decide within the practice what are the resources that are available or what resources need to be developed. Do you need to coordinate with your hospital? A lot of the hospitals uh, and insurances uh, have plans where you can get help uh, outside nursing staff, uh, people to call, okay, case management, all that type of thing. In some cases, the states have community health workers that you can be involved with. So population health management involves being proactive. It's team-based. This is not all on the dock. This is uh, on the whole team working together uh, for prevention, early intervention. Uh, and doing population health management lets you proactively identify the patients who really need your help. Uh, you can plan the care. You can reach out to the patients. You can provide self-management support to the patients. Very often just identifying these patients, having them come in and talk to them about it and showing your interest with them, you can get them to work with you, making it a good teaching moment. You can continue to monitor patient progress by using reporting, and then you can manage and monitor your practice performance by tra tracking that data. You know, if you look at that one slide where patients over nine, let's assume you put in an aggressive program and you're really working with your patients. Every time you run the report, if the total number number of patients who have hemoglobin A1Cs over nine continues to fall, you're making progress and it would look a lot like some of the slides that Dr. Gray showed you. So I hope that will help those of you who are in small practice who uh, really are going to do this independently to move forward again. So with that, I'm going to turn the uh, next part of the presentation over to Shima Heiliger and uh, go from there. Thank you and good afternoon everyone. Um, it's really great to, to be a part of this uh, webinar and um, I'm just excited about what was presented already and excited about talking to everyone about a care coordination toolkit that uh, was developed and has been used in some of the practice settings. I'm going to talk a little bit about care coordination and then break down what is included in the toolkit and what resources are, are in the toolkit and then Amanda will take it over at that point and actually give you an example of how the toolkit was actually utilized within the practice and um, how the practice was able to benefit from the toolkit. Next slide please. So as previously mentioned, what is care coordination? There are many definitions, some of which were already discussed, but all of them point to the same goal at its core. Care coordination is just what the name implies. It's a mechanism through which teams of healthcare professionals work together, ensuring that patients' health needs are met and that the right care is being delivered in the right place at the right time and by the right person. The Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality defines care coordination as the deliberate organization of patient care activities between two or more participants, including the patient, involved in a patient's care to facilitate the appropriate delivery of healthcare services. Care coordination is a patient and family-centered, assessment-driven, team-based activity designed to meet the needs of the patients and their families and or caregivers involved in their care. What happens when care is not coordinated? The consequences can be harmful to the patient, resulting in medication errors, repetitive testing, unnecessary emergency room visits, preventable hospital admissions, and readmissions, all of which lead to lower quality care and ultimately worse health outcomes. Poor care coordination can also make care more expensive than it needs to be, so definitely um, costly. At this time, let's go to a polling question. And the question is, is the practice currently coordinating care with patients? So the practices that you're working with, are, are they currently coordinating care with patients? Yes, we are coordinating care with every patient. Or yes, we are coordinating care with some patient populations. Or practice has thought about care coordination but not advanced. Or no, we have not looked into care coordination. Okay. 
give a few more seconds. All right, um, we've got 21% yes, we're coordinating, coordinating care with every patient. Uh, 64 yes, we're coordinating, coordinating care with some patient populations. Um, and 14% no, we have not looked into care coordination. So we're going to close the poll. And definitely care coordination should be in incorporated into the daily workflow of the provider practices. While care coordination support services will differ from practice to practice, varying on the number of providers, number of resources, as previously mentioned, what resources are available within the practice and also outside of the practice. Providers must focus on meeting the needs before, during, and after the visits with the patient and implement plans to enhance that care in between the visit, which is where the patient spends most of their time, obviously, outside of the practice and lots of things happen in between those visits. There are also benefits from using other healthcare professionals to expand the care team as needed. And again, that was previously mentioned with, you know, even utilizing outside resources, whether it's case management, care managers, uh, out, outreach, outreach workers from insurance companies or state resources. So now I'd like to tell you about the care coordination tool that was developed and is being utilized by uh, different organizations such as Health Visions Delmarva, PTN, also the New Jersey Academy of Family Physicians are using the toolkit with some of their practices and certainly here at Bay Health uh, Medical Center we're utilizing the tool as well. So the uh, care coordination toolkit provides an overview, education, and also includes the tools to support care coordination efforts at, in the, within the practices. It also contains resource materials for the patients, such as uh, patients with chronic conditions. The toolkit can help improve existing care coordination efforts or launch a new one. So it, it may enhance maybe some quick care coordination that you have if you're in the beginning phases of it or if you're thinking about launching care coordination services. And uh, I also would like to mention that we would be more than happy to provide the toolkit to the participants who are on the webinar today and there will be a later slide which has my contact information. So I look forward to anyone reaching out to me and contacting contacting me and I'd be happy to send you a toolkit at no cost to you. So just want to mention that and we'll remind you of that later on. So let me talk a little bit about the components and the uh, materials that are within the toolkit. First, there are materials on risk stratification. A lot of what's in the toolkit was mentioned uh, by previous presenters. Dr. Sobel uh, talked a lot about risk stratification. So there's some education talking about those three patient populations, that high risk patient population, which obviously is the higher spend, that rising risk and lower risk. and, and what are the patients that we should be looking for in those patient populations and what are the things that, that we can do. And risk stratification, mm -hmm. again, as Dr. Sobel mentioned, there are tools embedded within the EHR. There are also other tools that are available. It could be just as simple as asking each provider, okay, who are your top 10 sickest patients? You could also do it by of risk stratifying your patients based on how many comorbid chronic conditions they have, how many ED visits they've had, are they high, high utilizers in terms of using the ED for care. So there are many ways and that information is housed within the toolkit. So we have examples of that in the toolkit. And we also talk about things to focus on with that lower risk patient population. So certainly identifying the high risk and, and putting lots of resources and hands on deck with those patients, but also bringing in those patients who are lower risk for things such as their annual physical exam, screenings, vaccinations. So that is uh, certainly something that we have in the toolkit and there are specific examples of that. There are care coordinator work lists within the toolkit. So this is for that outreach. So once you've identified a patient population, so let's say you're looking at your hypertensive patients and you've identified who you want to follow. So who's going to be followed and need further outreach. So typically you're looking for medication compliance. You're looking to see what their blood pressures have been. 
there is a worksheet that has a section that has for a patient's name, their date of birth, their contact information, and some of those elements that I talked about, and it's specific to every condition. So we have one for diabetics, one for COPD, one for CHF, also the preventative care, that health maintenance, bringing those patients in. Some of this may be able to be uploaded in the EHR at the practice or the EHR may have something already so this may help to drive you to where to look into the EHR to find this or if you don't have it or if you like to use it on paper you can also do that but again you could put it in an Excel document a Word document but the the materials are there for you to use and see if your EHR has it or if not you actually have an example of one there's an example of a personal health record so again patient engagement family engagement is really important when care coordination is being performed with the patient so helping to engage the patient one educating them to be owners of their health care and having the tools of actual personal health record where they can house who are their providers where were they last seen what do they need to follow up on what current medications they are and actually taking that information with them to from practice to practice provider to provider and there's also information about the mobile app there are individuals who like to utilize mobile devices for things such as that and maybe not actually hold on to paper so there's an example of that also in the toolkit there's patient educational material lots of the patient education on the chronic conditions are in the stoplight format so there's an education for the staff who will actually be teaching the patients using the stoplight system to help manage their chronic conditions and symptoms. So there's instructions for the staff personnel who will be doing the teaching with the patients. And then there's all actual stoplights. So, you know, when your diabetic patient is in the green, what should they be doing? When their uh, sugars, uh, fasting blood sugars are within a certain range, when the hemoglobin A1C is in a certain range, when are they getting in that yellow zone? And what should they do? Who should they reach out to? What are some of the caution signs with that? And then obviously the red zone and the more emergent and what should they be doing? So there are certainly, again, not every condition we have in the toolkit, but certainly the major chronic conditions that we typically see from day to day. As mentioned before, care plans and care plans that encompass the multi multidisciplinary health care team. There are care plans that are in the toolkit that are specific for certain chronic conditions. And then there's also a basic generic care plan. So it's something that the provider or whoever is working with the patient, whether it's the care coordinator, the social worker, I identifies as a goal, again, getting the buy-in of the patient because having the patient engaged in this process is very important. So maybe that patient doesn't want to talk about how they can better manage their diabetes. Their concern is transportation. And so maybe that needs to be addressed before they can be engaged in terms of managing their diabetes. And so there's something very generic and has sections on there as to when to next follow up, who should follow up, and, and that type of thing. There are patient letters. So again, in the EHR, there are many tools and resources, and you can tap into those templates. But we also have examples of, of letters within the toolkit where you can reach out to patients whether it's for preventative care or whether it's to bring them in because they've been identified as a high-risk patient or you're communicating with them as far as being the care coordinator with them so there are lots of templates within the tool and then lastly the uh, toolkit talks about reporting and evaluation and that was mentioned previously by Dr. Graham on her slides and well she had several slides that showed evaluation on a population base so if you're doing all these things and you're providing the care coordination, whether it's to one patient or a group of patients, a population of patients, your data will show that. It will show your improvement over time. So again, if you're looking at your diabetic patient population and, and the hemoglobin A1C and how, how many patients are better controlled, or if you're just looking at that one patient and you're trending that patient's hemoglobin A1C or their blood pressures, you will see that in your, your reporting. Your data will definitely show, show that. So that's the last component. There's also a example of a flyer that some of the practices are using that introduces who what who is the care coordination team so it gives you an example of a flyer that you could develop that has you know the list of uh, staff that are involved in the care so it's, it's the physician obviously but they're also extenders of the healthcare team and introducing that to the patient and giving that to the patient so when they get that phone call maybe from the LPN or the social worker they know that this is part of my team and this team works with my physician and they're 
calling me. So there's an example of that within the toolkit. Um, so it, it definitely has a lot of the things that were discussed today. It doesn't have everything, but again, it can help enhance some of the care coordination efforts you have underway, or if you're just looking to start, it'll help point you in that direction. And I know um, Amanda, Hottenstein has definitely used the care coordination toolkit. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Amanda so she can discuss the actual implementation of it and give ex an example. Thank you, Tosh. Uh, I'm gonna I'm going to go over, like Tosh said, the implementation of how all the things that Dr. Gray, Dr. Sobel, and Tosh talked about today. How do you begin to do that in your in your practice? So. That, that is the question. How do you begin to implement care coordination within a practice? Uh, the biggest thing that I found working with practices is to start small. Don't pick, don't start to do this with every single patient that ever walks through the door. Maybe start with a specific patient population, a specific diagnosis, you know, your diabetic patients, or I've had gastro practices do it for their hep C patients, you know, a specific patient population within your patient population which tools will work best for the practice for that patient population. So Tosh went over a lot of tools that are in the toolkit. Uh, you know, not you won't necessarily use every single tool uh, implementing care coordination and risk stratification at your practice. So which ones work best for you and your staff and your team and the patients that you're working with? Build relationships with your medical neighborhood. Uh, this This means, you know, knowing who is on that team, who is providing that care coordination. If you're especially practiced, you need to pull in the PCPs as well uh, to have an input on this. Um, you know, this, uh, at the hospital, you need to pull in the social workers. You know, who, who is all going to be a part of this to best, um, you know, coordinate the care for the patients? Uh, and obviously commit to coordinating care. Uh, this goes with any performance improvement project, anything that you're looking at, you have to commit to it. You can't just develop this wonderful plan and then not stick to it and not follow through with it. You have to continually do the work. Next slide. So implementation. Uh, so you want to identify the high risk, that rising risk or low risk. Some practices just identify high risk. Uh, you want to provide education on care coordination to those patients. That, like Tosh gave a good example of using the brochure. Uh, you can't just start care coordination without the patient really knowing. They, they, don't, they need to know who's calling them, who's on that team, who, what they're doing, what care coordination is, just an uh, explanation of what coordinated care is and how it benefits them and how it helps their health. Uh, you, need, you really need to get the patient buy-in also for this to work. And Dr. Sobel made a point to that, you know, you really need to sit down and talk to them uh, and, you know, they're willing to work with you usually if you explain it. Implemented use of personal health records for each patient to use and share with all healthcare providers. Uh, this is something that I did in a practice. We created one specific to them. There is one in the care coordination toolkit that Tosh can provide to you if you want it. Uh, you know, having the patient have records himself with everything on it that they can update and take to each doctor that they visit. This happens a lot, uh, kind of in the elderly population. They have so many different doctors that they see that this really helps them, you know, contain the information that needs to be known that it can be taken to each provider. There are apps for this, actually, uh, and a lot of them are pretty well developed and worked really well uh, for you know, it just depends on your patient population you're working with if they're willing to kind of use the app method or not. Practice Some of the practices that I've implemented care coordination in, uh, the app didn't really work out for them for the patient population and they created little scorecards or little booklets for their patients to record this information. Uh, the stoplights is something that I've also used a lot in practices. Uh, you know, having the, the green, the yellow and the red, knowing when there's more of a risk. Uh, this again kind of goes for different diagnosis, uh, having a stoplight for hypertension, having a stoplight for uh, diabetes, different things like that. So uh, next slide. So in practices, I had a practice that we implemented care coordination. 
I wanted to go into it a little more, but I want to leave plenty of time for questions. But in that practice, after we looked at several things and identified their high-risk population, uh, looked at kind of the factors of what makes them high risk, what do they look at uh, in that patient, what would qualify them as being a more at more risk than another patient, uh, and made some changes as to how they care for that patient, how they make contact with that patient, how often that patient visits, stuff like that. Uh, after several, you know, several different areas this was kind of implemented in uh, and with follow-up and making some changes after a while, the data did show that, you know, identifying your high-risk population and having care coordination and implementing that in your practice does help. It reduced ED visits, reduced testing, unnecessary testing, there was higher patient satisfaction and engagement, there were improved test results within that patient population. Uh, they had better medication management, which is a big thing in a lot of practices I've been meeting with. You know, medication compliance is a hard thing. Uh, and they had better health and patient population overall. So next slide. Again, Tash, Tashima talked about the care coordination toolkit. If you would like a free care coordination toolkit, contact her and her information is there. Uh, it's It's again free and it's, it has all those tools in it that she discussed. It's a really great way to start care coordination in your practice. Also, uh, if you're with Health Vision Selmaru, you can always talk to your practice advisor to maybe do this as your next project. Next slide. And this is the contact information of the Health Vision, the rest of the Health Vision Selmaru team. Uh, my information is at the bottom. You can contact me as well. Uh, and I can talk to Tosh and Tashima and get you that care coordination toolkit. So I'm going to hand it back to Joy. Uh, we have a couple minutes left for questions. You can type them in the question box or you can raise your hand and Joy will be able to unmute you so you can ask questions. Okay, thank you everyone. And if you have any questions, just uh, push it on your taskbar and I will unmute you and you can ask your question or you can type it either way you'd like to do. Okay, is there no questions at this time? Okay, um, I guess this will conclude our webinar, if no one has any questions. Thank you all again for listening today. Uh, these slides will be, uh, they can be sent out if you would like them. And again, if you want the care coordination toolkit, contact Tashima and the video will be posted to the YouTube channel as well if you would like to rewatch it or have someone in your practice. Okay, we do have a question. Oh, okay. Um, my EHR cannot run data on, EH, on ER utilization. What, what tools or apps can I use to get this data? So this is Dr. Gray, depending on the hospital who's nearest you, if there's one main hospital that you use, you can always reach out to their IT department to see if they'll be able to furnish that for you. Um, the other way is just basic, um, uh, a lot of stuff we do manually. You know, if that patient comes in for follow-up and we see that they've been in the ED, you know, that patient gets flagged and the practice manager keeps the list of um, those patients so that you kind of get an idea of who they are. It's much more easy if it's done automatically, but don't discount being able to do it manually. You'll still get a good amount of information. Okay, thank you, Dr. Gray. Another, uh, to, fo to follow up on that as well, uh, depending where you are and depending exactly what information you're looking for on those patients, uh, there are the health information 
uh, exchanges like DIN or CRISP, where if you enroll through them and it's free, uh, they can tell you, they will send you in real time if you have a patient going into the ED, getting admitted into the hospital, and also when they get out of the hospital, when they get um, cleared to go. That is one way that you can get information on which of your patients are in the emergency department. Uh, and DIN and CRISP also have a couple other benefits to them. And if that's something you're interested in, you certainly can talk to your practice advisor for more information on that. Do we have any other questions? Um, that's, that's it. Uh, thank you everyone for attending the webinar. Amanda, I don't see any more questions. Okay. And no hands are raised. Then we can end the recording. All of this will be posted uh, and reach out to anyone on the